Greetings all. Welcome to The Hardest Word with me, your host, Brett DeHoot. So I have done with you. I don't know. I'm very sorry. Sorry. Sorry, sorry Graham. Well, finally, a special edition of the podcast I've been promising for far too long. A conversation with Patrick from Kigale, Rwanda. Now, Patrick delivered us a powerful apology that finished our first series. It revolves around his deep regret for not saving the life of his neighbour during the 1994 genocide. We're going to hear that apology. And then afterwards, you're going to hear a conversation with Patrick about why he made that apology, the impact of making it, and the roles that apologies are playing in the reconciliation and rebuilding of Rwanda, which has gained broad approval and admiration from around the globe. How do you start to put a country together after a genocide? Well, Patrick has some thoughts on that. The line is not great, it was via Zoom, but it is absolutely well worth the listen. First the apology, and then our conversation. My name is Gatete. I'm from Kigali, Rwanda. I want to apologize to the man I didn't save in 1994 genocide against Tutsi, something that's been haunting me for 24 years and it will probably haunt me for the rest of my life. It was 14th of April 1994, seven days since the unfathomable killing plan was being executed by Lutheran Hutu Mirishir. Kids were being slaughtered women raped, old men strangled, and men beaten to death. Thousands of people were getting brown up by grenades in the churches where they hoped to find solace. All the livers were colored, red by innocent people's blood, although it wasn't that horrific for me as for the Tutsis, because I, was, I wasn't being hunted. I was in the same ethnic group with the murderers, even though I didn't kill anyone, I feel guilty of a lot of people's death. I had a glimpse on the killer's hit list, and I knew many of victims. I could have warned them. Some were my neighbors who went to the same church every Sunday, but I didn't tell them what was coming for them, the horrifying death that was closing in. I always felt guilty for that. But again, I make an excuse for myself that if I had warned them and brought up the killer's long-term plan, they would have killed me too. And that excuse seems to block all those thoughts sometimes. But not, not one memory in particular, the memory of the man I didn't say when I called and I should have. Around 8 p.m., it was already a dark night and full of tellers. That's when a man knocked on my door. Open the door, please, he said in a very trembling voice. I recognized his voice immediately. Mushenjiz was a good man who had a beautiful family of seven, his wife Kamariza and six children, who were mostly teenagers and young adults. They murdered my whole family with machetes and they are following me here. He said with a wobbly voice, he came to my house probably because he knew that in the whole village I was almost the only Hutu who wasn't involved in killings, who had altercations with the Hutu leaders. He thought I could, I could save him. I was thinking about what to do when my wife kept whispering the same sentence over and over. Don't open for that cockroach. I thought about what the killers would do to me if they found one of their most wanted men hiding in my home. I stood in silence for a while before I told him to go somewhere else before he gave me killed too. Before he could speak again, we heard a sudden noise of people chanting louder and louder as they get close. It was them in their army trained cold hearted killers. They found him trying to flee from my house and they took him away chanting hateful words. I don't know if he survived, but it's very unlikely to escape the death when you got in the hands of an army. They hacked Tutsis with machetes 
and then they used the same machetes to butcher cows and eat their meat, lay there with the corpses lying down. They were monsters. Me, on the other hand, I was no different. What I did was the inhumane thing any person could do. I felt it guilty from that day until today. Before the genocide ends, I saved two to see teenage girls. I thought hiding them would make me feel less guilty, but it didn't. So, before I die, I want to apologize to you, my neighbor. You were a peaceful man. You didn't deserve all that. Your family didn't deserve to die like that. And I definitely don't deserve your forgiveness, but I'm going to ask anyway. Because guilty is a heavy burden to bear. Alone my life, alone my night's sleep, and my daily thoughts. If I could do it all over again, I would have saved you or died with you. Patrick, thank you for joining us on the program. My first question has to be, why did you decide to apologize? Okay, I've always wanted to get this off my chest and talk about how I feel about that particular day. And then I heard about this podcast, The Hardest World. After listening to other people's apologies, I knew it was the perfect place to let out my apology, so I did it. And have you apologized before about what happened on that night to a person or to a to a priest? Have you do you discuss it much? No, no, I, I didn't talk about it before. I did it on this podcast. And was it a very emotional process to write and record your apology? Did it bring up a lot of feelings inside you? Yes, yes, it did actually. As you can imagine, I was relieving that day. I thought about it more than I ever did before. Memories running through my head. Yes, I thought about it a lot. And how would you describe the feelings that occurred, that you felt when you were writing and recording the apology? Yes, uh, once again, I felt very guilty of what happened to the man I apologized to. Uh, I felt so sad that, uh, to the fact that I did, I don't know if he got the apology, if he's alive or dead, uh, I don't know. I thought I could feel better if I knew he was listening to me. And Patrick, I mean, that is a remarkable part of your apology. You really don't know what happened to that man, to your neighbor. You have you know, your imagination and you 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 know what happened to so many people on that day if it was possible that this man hears your apology what do you think he would feel about your apology and you honestly i i don't know how he would feel but i will hope very much hope that he can forgive me your wife is mentioned in the story in the apology how does she feel about what happened on that day? As you can imagine, she didn't take it very well, but she understood why I did it, and she admitted that she feels the same way sometimes. Your whole country is recovering from what happened in 1994. And yes. there is a lot of public effort and government programs to try and unite a country that was very divided. What role do apologies have in creating a united and peaceful Rwanda. Yes, the apologies play a great role in the reconciliation of the society. The Rwanda has a council which is in charge of seeing that the conciliation goes well. People apologized, some got punished a lot, got locked up and they released them and uh, victims actually forgave those who murdered their families. 
uh, after seeing what happened in Rwanda, no one could imagine that this reconciliation could even happen, but it did. So I think the apologies played a great role in that reconciliation. I mean, I have seen some documentaries and some reports about what is happening in Rwanda with the reconciliation. And people are returning back to the villages and they are meeting on a daily basis the people that they attempted to kill or people whose family they murdered. And somehow those villages are functioning. Somehow people are finding it in their heart to forgive or forget or move on. What does it say about human beings that there can be forgiveness not that long after the original crime? I, I think that's the, that's the most hardest thing to do, to forgive someone who murdered, for example, your mother or your father or maybe your whole family, but it, it happens. It's hard to understand, but it happens even it's the hardest thing to do, even to apologize. It's a, a heroic thing to do, and it takes a lot of courage to go in front of someone you did those terrible things to and apologize. I think it's a, a very human thing to do. Yes. Patrick. Uh, excuse me. No, that's fine, Patrick. It is very human. And I think people all around the world who have heard your apology sense that great humanity in you. And that's why it's caused such a reaction from so many people in so many countries. You said that you wanted to apologize because you felt bad about what had happened. After you heard the apology in the podcast, after you wrote it and recorded and sent it to me, have you felt any different? Yes, actually, I did feel different because I felt somehow relieved that I had to say it. Nobody knew what transpired on that day. I could have tried to keep my peace with it, but uh, it, it wasn't easy. After apologizing, I felt somehow different in a good way, but uh, I could feel better, even better, when that man I apologized to had the apology uh, and reacted to what I, I said. And between that night and between making your apology, how did your guilt impact or influence your life? Uh, it made me feel so bad. Like every time someone brought up the topic about genocide, Every time I saw that number, 1994, um, and uh, there is a, a commemoration week from 7th April to 14th, that's the, the hardest week I had to go through every year. They are mourning, so people are crying all over the country, and I think about it all the time. I couldn't sleep. It was the hardest thing to do, but just, I thought I could apologize. That's why I did. Patrick, uh, look, I can't thank you enough for your apology. And I can't thank you enough for joining us on the program to talk about it. From the minute we heard the apology, I knew it would be so powerful and make such an impact on people because it's very rare that we hear someone talk about something so serious and so intimate. And we it's as you said it's a very human thing to do and it's a very brave thing to do and we we greatly appreciate it patrick yes thank you for giving me time to do it too it's time to bring this whole sorry business to a close on behalf of our audio director brian wallace and me your host brett dehoot thanks for listening the website the hardest word farewell